Uh, welcome to um, the 2020 NORED. As you can see from the front, teach, learn, improve, and to do each of those continuously. That is the purpose of NORED. In 2007, I started NORED, and after a number of years, because it was so much work, I handed it off to David Craddock, who did it for a number of years. And then after that, Jonathan Hughes has been doing it for the past years. And I'd like to thank David Craddock and uh, Jonathan Hughes uh, for all of their efforts. Uh, neither one of them could be here uh, tonight, but uh, uh, they did an incredible job um, over all of these years. For 2020, I'm going to be directing NORED. And I, I'd like to start off um, just as a reminder that NOR is about continuing education and not only for our staff, but for our clients and for our guests. And yes, it is the sheets that are in front of you. You can fill them out. And thanks to Geraldine Robson, who collects them and makes sure that uh, architects that are in the audience um, receive the uh, accredited points through the OAA. I'm going to uh, slightly um, uh, change the NORED um, by taking it into three series um, in, in reorganizing it slightly. And the series are master series, architectural series, and engineering series. And the master series is one that I'm going to be adding. Uh, and it will be lectures about the great architects and engineers of the past, which we haven't had in the, in the past. Um, and of course, architectural and engineering series will continuing, can continue with to be lectures from distinguished architects and engineers. This year, for the first part of the year, uh, we've slated to have five. And we're going to start off by with David Bowick today, um, who is a senior principal at um, Blackwell Structural Engineers. The next one that we'll be seeing is um, uh, in March will be Molly Scott, who is uh, Noel Studio on the design story, Noel. The next one after that will be Stefano Pugliati, um, who um, has an office um, in Italy, and he's just recently opened an office here. And he will be talking about going west. Following that, we'll have an Antoine Chaya from RPBW Renzo Piano's office in Paris. And he'll be speaking about Manhattanville, Columbia University. And I will be doing a talk on Aero Saarinen. And as you can see on the left, as you receive the invitations, uh, they're separated off by series, whether they are the master series, architectural, or engineering series. So Molly Scott, who represents Noel Studio, she will be our, our next speaker. Um, she'll be here to really discuss some of the people that you see in this image, which dates back to 1961. And I won't tell you what issue or magazine it was in. Some of you know what magazine it was in. But it, it talks about um, design being not just about buildings, but it talks about the furniture that's in those buildings. And certainly Francis Noel recognized the importance of design uh, and hiring people like Errol Saren and Char Charles Eames and the other architects that, and designers that in, are in this image to work with Noel. So Molly Scott will be here uh, to talk about some of the furniture that the people that are in this image design and their history and the more recent designers at Noel. Stefano 
Pugliati, who was actually uh, with us today and just joined us at, at, at the end of the room. Uh, Stefano, just stand up so everyone can see you. Stefano is the uh, principal and founder of uh, Elastico SPA in uh, Chiri, Italy uh, since 1996 and has recently opened an office in Toronto. Um, as Stefano earned his degree at the University di Architettura di Venezia and his master's at Sci Arc in Los Angeles, California. And Stefano, this is one of Stefano's projects, and uh, this project is called uh, Slow Horse. It's a hotel. And Stefano will be here um, in two months talking about his, his title will be Going West. This next image will be about Manhattanville and it's Antoine Chaya's um, talk. Uh, Antoine is a partner and director at Renzo Piano's office in Paris. Um, Renzo Piano's office has been working on Manhattanville for a very long time. They worked on the master plan of those of you that know the project. It's an extremely large project. Uh, Anton's been working on it for a very long time and he will be here to tell us the story of that project. Uh, Antoine is uh, also uh, the um, principal in charge of the new Toronto Courthouse as of recently. You can't miss this project. So when I was in high school, I actually did a rendering of this building. Uh, I could say it's one of my favorite buildings, but when I was in high school, I'm not sure I really understood what architecture was all about. Now I do. It's still one of my favorite buildings. So um, Eero Saarinen, um, uh, Finnish American architect. Um, it's not very many of us that can say that we had a father and a mother uh, that were as talented as uh, Eero Saarinen uh, had. And to have friends like um, Florence Snow um, and Charles Eames uh, to grow up in that kind of environment uh, must have been pretty incredible. And the wealth of work that he did and uh, uh, lifespan was very short. Uh, so um, I think by June, when I'm going to be doing this talk, I'm going to be doing a lot of research and a lot of work uh, putting the presentation together. So hopefully I'll see quite a few of you here for that. Before I introduce the um, speaker, I'd like to uh, just talk about a very brief story about um, a project. In 2003, Nor was shortlisted for the Canadian Plaza at the Peace Bridge uh, border crossing between Fort Erie and Buffalo. There were 23 submissions, nine teams, and they interviewed three, and we happen to be one of those three, of course. Um, Webb Zarafa was one of the other ones, Young and Right with Bunting Cody and us. Um, this was a, a Canadian open competition and David Clusio was here in the room and Andrew Schmidt and I worked on this project and um, I said to the two of them, we got to win this project and we did. So we took the $25,000, which was the stipend if we actually would have won and spent it all on the model, uh, did everything we possibly could. Um, David decided to come up with a, a design, as, as you can see from uh, uh, the secondary uh, um, inspection area that was uh, pretty innovative. Um, it was a, a wood roof um, that was fairly complex. Um, Andrew uh, worked on making it as complex as he could, and David uh, David decided that we didn't want any columns that were actually vertical uh, in the building. So, uh, you know, it, it, it was definitely a complex uh, project from a geometrical point of view. Uh, and then structurally at the time, uh, we had nobody in the office in our, we, we had a pretty good structural department, but nobody in the office that could actually tackle a roof like this. So uh, I said to Peter Wagner, we've, we've got to go out. And uh, so we went out and brought the most talented uh, wood designer at the time, this young guy from Blackwell by the name of David Bowick. And it was the first time that we it's met. Tell me how long the project, how long the project was. 
<laughs> and, uh, and he came in, and, and guess what? Uh, we won. Um, and on the jury of 15 people, there was one engineer. And after we won, um, David and I went down to uh, Fort Erie on a Saturday morning. And this engineer came up to us and said, I never voted for your, your entry because, you know, there's no way that your rendering, which actually looked like this, uh, is ever going to stand. Your engineer doesn't know what he's doing, and there's no way those columns are going to work. You know, the wood isn't going to look like that. And I didn't vote for you guys, you know, and I'm surprised that you guys won. <clears throat> well, in, uh, uh, when we actually finished the building at the opening, he was there. And he came up and apologized. <laughs> and it's too bad David wasn't there because I would have introduced him to David. So before I ask David to come up, uh, I want to read an excerpt from um, David's um, uh, company, Blackwell, uh, mission statement, uh, which is apropos for this talk today. And it, I'm only going to read a, a small piece of it, which I think is really important. We, le we believe that our collegial environment is critical to our success. We find joy in what we do. We value constant learning, improvement, and teaching others. We are proud to affect positive change in the built environment and in the community at large. So with that, I'd like to ask David Bowick to come up and speak about his subject today, Mass Timber. David. Well, thank you everyone for having me. Um, this is going to be very fun. Um, uh, talking about Mass Timber is an interesting thing because, because there's always uh, a, such a, a rich diversity in the audience, people who who don't know anything um, and and want to know, and people who know a lot, and um, um, so hopefully for the people who don't know anything, we're we're taking a. I'm going to try and take a really thin slice off the top. For the people who know a lot, you may not learn anything, but but you may hear <coughs> something that you already knew articulated in a new way, which is which is fun. I I, I remember that. When HGTV came out, I used to watch, you know, this old house periodically and things. I never learned anything, but it was really fun to watch and have the things you already know validated and expressed in a different way. So I'll try and do that. Um, Silvio, thank God you showed the Fort Erie Peace Bridge because as the slide was loading, I was thinking, you know, there's a, a very, very conspicuous absence in my slideshow, and it's the Fort Erie Peace Bridge uh, project. <laughs> Because it's normally, like, anybody who's done this, you know, every lecture builds on the last lecture and, and you're always adding material and deleting material. And, and that was one of the core slides that was irrelevant to some prior lecture. And so I took it out and, and, uh, and as I came in, I thought, oh, my God, I forgot to put it back. So now, you, now you've seen a lovely, lovely project. Um, I'm going to try and, and share a few anecdotes as I go, even if they're not directly relevant to Mass Timber. <coughs> Um, when we were working on this project, we knew that the columns for the for the um, uh, for the, the big canopy cover had were going to be exposed to view, needed to be expressive, and I had this idea that we would make a, a beautiful cast pin for the end of it. And uh, so I sketched something up and I brought it and presented it in the meeting. And and uh, at the meeting, there was a young intern architect from U of T sitting in the meeting, working, doing a work term at, um, at, uh, uh, at NOR, uh, Carlos Oliveira, who then went on to found Cast Connects, and their very first product was a cast pin for, for exactly that application. And I think he already had it worked out, and he was just had to keep his mouth shut during, because, uh, because, because he didn't, couldn't let the cat out of the bag just yet. So. I, I feel very proud to, to be able to feel like I might have been part of the genesis of, of uh, that extraordinary company. So what is the deal with mass timber? Um, to understand what mass timber is, we've got to start by understanding what heavy timber is. Um, so the building code defines heavy timber as uh, 
uh, a timber arranged in heavy solid masses with essentially smooth flat surfaces to avoid thin sections and sharp projections. It sounds like a strange definition, but the reason heavy timber has a definition under the building code is because the fire performance is substantially better than, than uh, stick framing, uh, two by fours and two by sixes, and inherent or critical to the improved fire performance is the smooth flat surfaces without thin, thin sections and sharp projections. Mass, or heavy timber has, uh, is, is uh, characterized by certain minimum dimensions, six by elements for columns, four bys for beams, uh, three bys for uh, floor decks, and two bys for roof decks. And, in, and built into heavy timber, the definition of heavy, heavy timber is an inherent 45 minute fire rating. So what is mass timber? Well, mass timber doesn't actually have a definition on, under the building code. Colloquially, mass timber is understood to be a building system comprising large engineered elements manufactured by assembling smaller pieces of sawn lumber using adhesives or mechanical fasteners. So people tend to equate mass timber with CLT, cross-laminated timber, uh, but really it's just because mass timber and CLT kind of came into the language in sort of the same week. And, um, um, but, but it's large engineered lumber. Um, big big panels and uh, and glue lamb. Um, with mass timber, fire ratings are calculated in accordance with the NBCC, and uh, and so there are inherent fire ratings and then enhanced fire ratings based on on depth of char. And we can talk we can talk uh, a little bit about that. So what do we do about fire and rot? Uh, what about code? What about building tall? So these are the the, the kind of big questions around. Um, working in mass timber. Um, this is anybody who has conversations about mass timber. This is old news to them, but it's still interesting. So, so um, mass timber, the structural core of the wood is protected by a layer of char um, around the outside. So, as the wood burns, it forms a layer of char, which is is a fantastic insulator uh, protecting the core. Um, when we design, uh, we design uh, typically in the case of fire, we have we design for roughly one third less load than um, than the normal occupancy, which means that if you have 75% of your capacity left after that char layer is formed, then then your structure is performing is going to perform adequately. Um, so we we fire protect mass timber by adding more lumber which is counterintuitive because you think of lumber as a fuel. Um, but if you've ever tried to start a campfire with a piece of firewood, a log, you'll realize that it is actually impossible. Lumber will not sustain, or wood will not sustain combustion in the absence of a re-radiating surface. So I'm quoting my good pal Steve Kraft, a fire consultant, when I say that. But it's so beautifully articulated that um, and wood will actually self-extinguish on a flat surface, which you know if you've ever tried to start a campfire without kindling. Um, so when you have, if you have an entire, entirely uh, a wood with it, or a room with entirely wood surfaces, mass timber surfaces, it will burn in the corners um, where the wall meets the ceiling, um, and it'll burn in the corners of the wall where wall meets wall because the two surfaces will radiate against each other, but it'll self-extinguish on the large surfaces if, if you don't have an external fuel source. Beautiful image here. This is, this is um, I believe that this was after a great fire in, in San Francisco at the turn of the last century. Um, steel beams that have, that have essentially been turned to spaghetti by the heat of the fire being supported on the, the uh, protected core of a timber beam. I should say that, that um, and this, is, this will be no surprise to you uh, as architects, but, but when it comes to fire, we, we're concerned with a number of critical things. One is the combustibility of the material, the fuel load that it contributes. Um, the second is the fire rating, how long will it stand up to allow people to um, time for egress. Um, and then the third thing, we're containing fire by fire compartments. And, um, um, the compartmentalization and the, and the fire ratings, we can do in wood without any help whatsoever. 
Um, so, so we can achieve the fire rating by adding by adding enough timber to, to generate that char layer. Um, what we can't do is make it non-combustible. Um, wood contributes fuel load. So a concrete building, when the when the fuel source is exhausted, the, the contents of the building are exhausted, the fire self-extinguishes. Um, in a wood building, <clears throat> the um, a mass timber building, when the contents are gone, there's still fuel and, and the building will continue to burn. Um, so when we're doing when we're when we're building in mass timber, we we end up having to, to incorporate a number of compensating measures to compensate for the reduction in safety that comes from, from the structure being um, a source of fuel. Um, fortunately, those compensating measures have become reasonably well understood. There's uh, redundant uh, sprinklers, um, redundant sprinkler uh, water <coughs> supplies, um, increased sprinkler coverage, uh, there's partial encapsulation, there's increased site security. So there are a number of of um, techniques that have been developed um, to allow us to push back the, the uh, combustible construction limits. This is a lovely image of the, the, from the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in 1911. Um, this was a terrible, devastating fire. There was an awful lot of loss of life. Um, the loss of life all came from the fact that the building owner was blocking exits and, and, uh, and things like this. Um, and none of it came as a result of, of structure. You can see that the structure did exactly what it was supposed to do. It, um, uh, it, it maintained its integrity throughout the duration of the fire until the fire was out. Next thing we're, we're constantly facing is, is, um, is concerns about water. People perceive wood as, as not being a durable material, which is also a, a, a big misconception about, about wood. Um, wood will not decay in the absence of liquid water. So humidity doesn't have any, any negative impact on wood, um, only liquid water. And if we have a proper building envelope, then, then we keep the liquid water out. And in fact, um, if you have wood, it's a good insulator, so it's, a, it's got a low, thermal, um, a low thermal conductivity. And because of that, it doesn't tend to... to um, promote uh, dew formation or, or condensation. Um, so even in the areas, even if the building is intact, in a high humidity area, you'll get condensation on steel surfaces because of change of temperature throughout, throughout the day. You don't get that in wood. And if there is condensation, wood is an absorptive material. So, so it actually can mitigate. So it's, it performs actually very well in, in that respect. This little diagram shows you. So, so decay. Um, uh, fungal growth requires a moisture content in the wood, in the wood of about 25% or greater. And I remember thinking, well, you know, in a normal room has 30% atmospheric humidity, or relative humidity, that's really problematic. All the wood's going to decay. But in fact, the, the moisture content in the wood, at um, we need an atmospheric humidity of close to 100% relative humidity to get close to and a sustained um, relative humidity of close to 100% to, to start to approach 25% moisture content. And in normal building environment, the wood will season down to somewhere in the range of 10%. A lot of questions about cost of timber construction. Um, this is a Hanscom study um, where they designed three prototypical office buildings, and uh, one in mass timber encapsulated, one in mass timber exposed, one in steel, and one in concrete. And uh, we can see that, that building one, mass timber building and structure not encapsulated, uh, $176 million. Building three, which would be the closest comparison, uh, which was a concrete building structure, $182 million. Um, so it was actually less. Now they did, I think it wound up being last because they took advantage of, uh, of uh, things like speed of construction, for example, which is faster in mass timber than it would be in concrete. Now, this is inconsistent. Well, this is a legit study commissioned by the National Research Council. This is inconsistent with the anecdotal feedback that we get from the marketplace. The anecdotal feedback we get from the marketplace is that, is that the mass timber is about 15% more expensive. 
Um, but that's 15% premium on the cost of the structure, which represents at most 15 or at most 20% of the cost of the building. So, so we tend to say that the premium is around 3% um, uh, to build in mass timber. But it doesn't have to be. Um, I think one of the reasons why mass timber is, uh, is shown to be more economical here is because this study optimized the mass timber. It was probably six meter bays, whereas the concrete had nine meter bays or something. I think it probably wasn't a direct apples and apples, but, but certainly it's not a, a dramatically more expensive um, way to build. I love this. Um, I love this graph on the left. Because we think of strength of material um, appropriately. I mean, we need material to be strong uh, to carry the buildings. Uh, we rarely think in terms of strength density. That is the, uh, well, this is, well, this is strength density and, and modulus density. So, so take the strength of the material divided by its weight, or take the elastic modulus divided by its weight. And you're going to see that the softwoods are, are, softwoods are the pale blue ellipse. And steel is the purple. Um, so relative to, to its weight, um, wood is comparable to steel in terms of strength and stiffness density and significantly better than, um, uh, than concrete. What's also interesting is you see that, that softwoods are better than hardwoods in terms of strength density. So hardwoods are stronger, but they're also heavier, and they're heavier than they are stronger. So, so the, 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 weight of, uh, the weight of concrete and the weight of hardwoods count against them if you're, if you're, considering, um, if you're considering that. And, and softwoods and steel are quite comparable. I touched on this already. Um, you know, pe people are concerned by building codes, obviously. Um, we need to conform to building codes. Uh, building codes have placed a, a hard limit. Um, the current building code has a hard limit, six-story limit, on um, wood frame construction. Uh, in the building code, and um, and the 2020 National Building <coughs> Code is anticipating 12 stories encapsulated mass timber construction. So it can be mass timber, but you've got to protect it all in drywall. Um, and so these are hard limits within the building code, but there is also the provision in the building code, the alternative solutions section, which allows you to exceed the, the fixed limits provided you can demonstrate that, that you meet the intent of the code from a, from a life safety point of view. So we've got projects underway right now. 77 Wade has been through the alternative solutions uh, process, has the, has the alternative solutions approval, um, and is, is going to start construction sort of within the year. Um, it's eight stories, 150,000 square feet, entirely exposed, or almost entirely exposed uh, mass timber. Um, we're working on a tower right now at the University of Toronto at St. George at the end, St. George and Bloor, um, which is 14 stories, um, which will be largely exposed mass timber. And that one, the, the alternative solutions report is in front of the building officials and, and we're getting critical feedback. But we're not, we're not um, facing an ideological barrier, we're facing techn technical barriers. And and many of you have been down this path that the technical barriers, oops, that the technical problems are easy to solve, ideological problems are intractable. So we're we're confident that we're going to get get over that hurdle on on the uh, uh, the academic tower at University of Toronto. The International Building Code, just to, talking about about sort of expanding limits. The International Building Code 2021 is anticipating 18-story uh, encapsulated mass timber construction, and 12 stories partially exposed and 8-story fully exposed. So our 77 Wade project would actually <coughs> satisfy the, the American IBC, the 20, 2021 IBC uh, by rate. The taller, anything taller than 6-story is all mass timber, by the way, not, not, not light wood frame. So, so we can we can knock off the, the drawbacks. What are the benefits of building in mass timber? Or are there any benefits in building ma with mass timber? It's cool. It looks great. People love it. Um, it's trendy. Um, those are benefits for sure. But um, from a sustainability point of view, this is not news to, to anybody in the room. I'm certain that um, 
that mass timber will actually encapsulate one ton of um, carbon dioxide for every cubic meter of um, uh, for every cubic meter of, of um, mass timber that, that's used in the construction. Um, so it winds up being the structure is net carbon negative in the building as opposed to to contributing the greenhouse gases. Now, maybe you've all got your head around this. I struggled with this for a long time. Um, how can something that doesn't weigh a ton encapsulate a ton of greenhouse gas? So I'm going to answer that question because I asked that question. It's because we only have to encapsulate the carbon, not the oxygen. So the one ton of carbon dioxide, much of that weight is in the O2 part of the CO2. If we encapsulate the carbon, we've essentially encapsulated a ton of CO2. So we capture the carbon in the wood, not the oxygen. Um, this is a quote that I enjoyed from, from Environment Industry Magazine. I'm not sure if that is the name of the publication, but that's who is credited. And the Environment Industry Magazine, which is a non-affiliated kind of affiliated magazine, says the best thing that we can do is preserve the forest through responsible management while harvesting as much wood as sustainable for the production of construction products. So it was for the production of long life <laughs> products such as construction products. So making a chair out of wood doesn't actually help us all that much because, um, because as much as we're encapsulating carbon, we're only encapsulating it for about the duration that it would lie on the floor of the forest. And, uh, and after that, as soon as you burn it, as soon as it rots, you, you um, release the carbon into the atmosphere. But if we can encapsulate that carbon in something that lasts longer than the tree would have lasted, then we're actually achieving a net benefit. And, uh, and so if we can build, encapsulate the carbon by building wood buildings that have a long life, um, then, uh, then we're actually doing something, something very good. So building sustainably, um, embedded in that is the long life portion. We have to build buildings for a long life. Um, uh, there's your uh, architects are probably very familiar with with the notion of loose fit or long life, loose fit, and low energy as the key to to building sustainably. There was a study in Minneapolis, the, a study of buildings that had been demolished in Minneapolis over some period of time, and they found that the wood buildings being demolished were almost entirely over 75 years old. Um, the concrete and steel buildings were typically less than 50 years old. Um, not because concrete and steel don't last as long as wood. They certainly do. The materials are, are very long life, very durable materials. It's that they were being used in building types that didn't, um, that didn't outlast their purpose. And so the buildings were being demolished. So you know, the concrete industry will often say, well, our, you know, we've got a material that'll last 500 years. It doesn't matter if the material lasts 500 years, the building has to. The reason the buildings were old is because the building stock, the old building stock in mass timber or in, in wood, um, followed this kind of loose fit long life uh, model. Uh, not intentionally, they, no one had ever sort of coined that phrase at the time, but, um, uh, but we see that in the Toronto building stock. Um, in the garment district where our office is, there are, there are a number of brick and beam buildings that have been repurposed and as uh, they went from manufacturing to studios probably live work studios, offices, so they're in, they're in their second or third life. We can't talk responsibly about wood without, without talking about concrete um, and our uncomfortable relationship with concrete. I mean, concrete is absolutely ubiquitous in construction because, let's face it, it's, it's the best thing we can build with. It's, it's very long life. It's, um, uh, it's fire safe. It doesn't promote mold growth or, or fungal growth. Um, it, um, uh, concrete, interestingly, it was, it was in preparing for this talk or one like it that I realized that, that there's, an, in, there's a, an interesting inverse relationship between strength and the shallowness of a system. That the stronger the material is, the deeper the structure needs to be, which is completely counterintuitive because you gain strength by depth. Um, but, the, but if we want a shallow system, we use a weak material. And so all our buildings, all our office buildings, our, our uh, residential buildings where we're trying to cram as many floors in as we can under our, our height limit, um, 
are all built with, uh, with concrete because our concrete is the material that can be shallow. It's not that we can't build floors out of steel plate and make them shallower than concrete, but you have to build them out of steel plate and it would cost you a fortune. So, so our weak materials are our, our weak material systems are our shallow systems and, um, and concrete fits that. So, so concrete, if we, if we forget about sustainability and we forget about the fact that we love the way wood looks, concrete is genuinely the best thing that we can build with. The trouble with concrete is, is the tremendous amount of greenhouse gases that are, emis are emitted um, primarily from the production of cement, um, but also from the other activities, the mining activities um, associated with the production of concrete. So whatever we can do to reduce concrete is going to benefit humanity. So taken in all stages of construction, concrete amounts to 4 to 8 percent of the, of the global output of greenhouse gas emissions. Sand is also a huge problem. I wasn't even aware of this a year ago because it's not a problem in Canada. But um, there are literally sand cartels and organized crime built around sand and people are being murdered by sand pirates because there is a global shortage of construction sand. We use, the world uses enough concrete in any given year to build a wall 80 feet tall and 80 foot wide around the equator. It's a, just a staggering amount of concrete. Um, in the Middle East, you would think there's lots of sand in the Middle East, and there is certainly lots of sand in the Middle East, but wind sand is no good for construction. Um, sand for construction has to be water sand, and um, so it's got to come from lake and riverbeds and, and um, beaches and, and uh, uh, in the Middle East. They're bringing sand in from Australia for construction projects. And, and of course, mining sand is tremendously, tremendously environmentally detrimental. So, so dredging rivers stirs up silts, it blocks out light, it kills fish, it kills plants, um, undermines banks, which causes um, construction to, you know, infrastructure to fail. It's, it's really, uh, sand is tremendously problematic. Um, another problem with concrete is silicosis. So, so long-term exposure to to silica used in, in concrete, to sand, um, to fine sand, um, uh, causes chronic lung problems for, for people who work in, in concrete, both in manufacture and in construction. So what about wood? Well, wood is, wood is dusty, we could say. I mean, wood produces sawdust, um, but it's not the same. First of all, the fibers, the, the, uh, the dust fibers are larger, so they're not as problematic when you breathe wood dust, but also wood, most of the crafting of the wood happens off-site. It's not generating construction site dust, and uh, and off-site it's done in controlled. The manufacture of wood is done in controlled environments with um, uh, with air control and vacuums and filters <coughs> and things. So it's so it is actually much cleaner. Uh, mass timber construction is faster than than um, uh, than concrete construction. Could be comparable to steel, I would expect. Um, the on-site portion, so there's there's a great deal of time spent at the beginning in the production of shop drawings and the off-site manufacture, but once it starts, it's much faster than uh, than concrete construction. Um, it's quieter than than concrete construction. Um, it's warmer, which is sort of counterintuitive, but anybody who's been on a construction site with concrete knows that it's a cold place and it's cold even in the summertime. Uh, it's a cold place because concrete you experience radiant cooling. The concrete is a wonderful thermal mass, and if you if you spend your time around bare concrete, you're spending your time in a in a. Well, even if the air temperature is warmer, you're colder because the concrete is cold, cooled off at night, and it's wet, so it's drying. Uh, whereas wood doesn't re-radiate, or it, sorry, wood is it. Um, Wood doesn't have the, the uh, radiant cooling effect that concrete does. So, so um, I mean, this is anecdotally, it's reported that people are, are more productive and happier working in, um, in work sites that are built in mass, uh, mass timber. So these are, these are studies probably done by, funded by the wood industry, so we'll take them all with a grain of salt. But, but, but there have been peer-reviewed studies that have demonstrated increased productivity um, in people working in wood environments, uh, reduced absenteeism, and, and uh, generally um, happier people.
Wood is associated with, with lower stress, uh, lower blood pressure. So a wood environment um, and has been demonstrated to reduce the uh, reduce cortisol, which is the stress hormone, the fight or flight hormone, and suppress the sympathetic nervous system, just being in an environment with lots of wood. Um, this, this last statistic, and I did not make this up, um, uh, people in wood environment, their heart beats 3,500 fewer times per day. Um, that's 45 minutes worth of heartbeats. So if you subscribe to Donald Trump's notion that, uh, that, that you have so many heartbeats in your life and it doesn't really matter how you live, well, then, then 45 minutes a day really adds up to an awful lot. What is a hygric mass? Um, so it, it contributes to the humidity, it, it contributes a humidity flywheel effect. So what that means is that wood, when it's humid, will absorb the, uh, absorb the moisture um, and generally lower the relative humidity of the air. And when it's dry, wood will release that moisture and generally raise the relative humidity of the air. So it, it, it's, a, it's a, um, a mass buffer in the similar way to people, the way that people associate concrete as a thermal mass, wood can be a, um, a humidity mass. Wood is actually also a good thermal mass, which is completely counterintuitive. And if you look at this statistic, the thermal mass of concrete, 0.875 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, um, thermal mass of wood is 15% is, um, more. Um, one kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin. Um, again, counterintuitive. That does not mean that wood is a more effective thermal mass. It means that it has more thermal mass per unit of mass. So if we condense wood, if we squeeze it down to be the density of concrete, the mass of concrete, then we would find that the thermal mass is, is, is equal, but it's 40% it's of the density of concrete, which means that that for the same volume of wood, it's got only 40% of the thermal mass. But it does have an awful lot of thermal mass. Um, it's a poor conductor, though, um, which means you don't have access to it. So, so with concrete, we'll absorb and radiate um, heat on a daily cycle. Um, wood is a much poorer conductor, so it's a much longer cycle. Um, but it does have a tremendous amount of thermal mass, which is a benefit. It's not. It's not, not quite the benefit that concrete is, but, it's a, but it is a benefit. Commercial landlords are reporting higher rents, higher quality tenants, and shorter vacancy periods. I had heard this before at Lady, AD Atlantic opened. Um, you're all familiar with AD Atlantic, I assume. It's a really great project from Quadrangle um, that opened recently, Hallmark Development. But that project is validating that statement. Um, Hallmark <laughs> has been very happy with the, the tenants um, and, and the rents they're getting. It's a great success for them. So, sounds like everything's great, right? Why wouldn't we build everything? So we do have a few things that we have to keep in mind. Um, vibration and acoustics. Everything can be managed, so these are, these are technical challenges, but, we, but uh, they are challenges. So, um, wood is, is, uh, can be made to be as stiff as we need it to be. So, on one, so there are two parts to vibration. There's there's um, uh, the frequency of the, the, the uh, vibration, and there's the amplitude of the vibration. The frequency we control by stiffness. The higher the stiffness, the, the higher the frequency, and once the frequency is above 10 hertz, we just don't really worry about it anymore. Um, the amplitude is controlled by mass, so we increase the mass, we reduce the amplitude, and, and the, the, the two things are um, kind of work opposite each other. Um, wood is lightweight. We can make it as stiff as we need it to, but it's a lighter weight material. It's only 40% of concrete, which means that wood is more vulnerable to vibration than concrete. And so vibration winds up controlling um, our designs. Um, acoustics, similarly, acoustic sound transmission through a membrane is, uh, is mitigated by mass. If you've got 40% of the of the mass, you're going to have you're going to have that <coughs> proportional increase in a, in sound transmission, and so we've got to manage sound. So typically, we manage sound with a, an acoustic mat above the wood, and ironically, a concrete topping. Um, 
is the standard. So, so we, we put a concrete topping to, to give us the mass we need to manage the sound transmission. Um, one of the things, so there's, there's transmission and reflection, of course, the two parts of, um, of um, acoustics uh, in buildings. Um, we talked about the, uh, the sound transmission. The reflection, um, Steve Titus, what was, what was his quote? Damn it. <coughs> talked to Steve Titus about this from, from uh, Air Acoustics, and he said that, that wood benefits from a psychological, there's a psychological acoustic benefit from wood, that wood, because it's a warm environment, one assumes that it's, that, uh, it's going to muffle sound, that it, but that it will absorb sound. In fact, it's more reflective than concrete. Not much. Um, so all the solutions we use in a concrete building for, for mitigating sound and absorbing sound are the same ones we would use in a wood building. But we find that the U of T tower, for example, we, we're winding up, you know, the, the intent was to have a fully exposed structure because if you're going to spend all the money, why wouldn't you look at it? But the fact is that, that a significant portion of our ceilings wind up being covered um, not because of fire requirements, but, but uh, for acoustic mitigation. So there are lots of solutions to this. So, so sound reflection mitigation. There, are, there are uh, the panels that that we can add. And 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 as architects, you're well well familiar with with the the things you can do to mitigate uh, sound reflection. And to mitigate sound transmission, we typically add mass by pouring concrete over top of our our wood. Another thing we have to be very conscious of when we're building in in tall wood is is shrinkage. So we typically um, associate uh, wood with about 2% shrinkage perpendicular to grain and about 0.1% shrinkage parallel to grain. So to put that in context, wood will shrink about a quarter of an inch per foot of perpendicular to grain distance. So when we're building a house, um, just a regular wood frame house, the studs are parallel to grain. We neglect the studs from, from a shrinkage point of view. But if we add the double top plate of the stud, plus the depth of our joist, plus the plywood, plus the single top plate of our bottom, uh, of, our, of the wall above, we wind up with about a foot of perpendicular to grain wood um, per story. And so we anticipate about a quarter of an inch per story of um, shrinkage in platform construction. So a quarter of an inch per story is too much. It's problematic, especially when we're dealing with a quarter of an inch per story based on one foot. When we start building um, mass timber, we might have we might have three foot deep beams, so they're th shrinking three quarters of an inch, um, and we might be ten stories. So we we wind up with seven and a half inches of shrinkage accumulated over the height of the building. So we can't have that, obviously, which means that we can't do platform construction when we start building tall. Yep? Uh, sorry, just a question. How often is that shrinkage uh, observed? Like every year, every... No, that's once. So, so, we're, we're, the, so the, the quarter of an inch per foot or the 2% shrinkage is, that's the shrinkage that happens when wood seasons from about 15% down to about 10%. Um, once it's at, it's at 10%, Seasonal fluctuation, fluctuations in humidity, they do affect the dimensions of wood. They, it does shrink and, and grow, but not in a meaningful way. So it suddenly it becomes comparable to the kind of the temperature effects on, you know, hard surfaces and things. Like it's, it's not meaningful. It's, um, it does happen, but it's not significant. Um, so what it means is we can't do platform construction. Uh, we, we have to make sure that, that um, all our parallel to grain wood carries on in a continuous way, that a column sits on top of a column. It can't sit on top of a beam which sits on top of a column, for example. Um, uh, the other challenge with, with shrinkage is the fact that I say perpendicular quarter of an inch per foot or 2% perpendicular to grain, but in fact, it's something like you know 2.5% perpendicular to grain in the annular direction and about one and a half percent perpendicular to grain in the radial direction. So it's not, it's, it's really completely orthotropic, which is why when you see this diagram, you can see that that top piece cups. 
um, you've got um, it, because it shrinks, you get twist and you get cupping because it shrinks more perpendicular to grain than parallel to grain. So it doesn't tend to be a problem in mass timber because mass timber, we're building up our elements out of smaller elements. And uh, so the overall shrinkage is, is a concern, but we don't tend to have the twisting problems because for every one that's going to cup one way, you're going to glue it to one that's going to cup the other way. And on balance, there's no net. There tends not to be a net effect. The thing with um, we have to be concerned with 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 uh, mass timber construction is beam shadowing. Um, so if we're going to expose the mass timber, um, then then the beams get in the way of natural light penetration. And uh, you know the the concrete the buildings like the one that that our office is in at 134 Peter, it's flat slab with with shallow drop panels, tapered drop panels, really really conducive to natural light penetration. Um, we get into a steel building. Inevitably, steel buildings have have ceilings because they need them for fire protection. So a multi-story steel building, you never see the steel. Um, you've always got a ceiling. Ceilings can be flat, really conducive to natural light penetration. Um, whereas beam shadowing is a is a real barrier. This was taken at KPMB's office. We were working on a competition, and and I mentioned the notion of it was for a mass timber building. I talked about beam shadowing and we all looked up and saw like this is just from the first bay to the second bay and it just gets darker as you go in. Um, and we contract this to Alvar Alto's Villa Madeira where, with just a big wood ceiling and glazing up to the ceiling and you can see the tremendous impact of, of uh, how far the light penetrates into the room. So a lot of buzz these days about mass timber construction. Makes it seem like it's new. It's certainly not new. Um, I'm going to show you some projects. I just went through our, our archive and populated it with projects. Every project I could think of except for the Peace Bridge because I thought it was in here already and it turns out it's not. Um, um, so this is, this is the oldest one or one of the oldest ones, the Google uh, offices in, in Waterloo, a repurposed mass timber building. Uh, long span um, heavy or mass timber. This is heavy timber, not mass timber. Long span trusses. Um, this is one of our first one of our first projects, a leisure center with McLennan Young Collins Miller in in Milton. And I'm just I'm going to throw in anecdotes because they're interesting every once in a while. So MJMA had an idea to build a mass timber building or to build a a glue lamb roof over this pool. Um, and they wanted something expressive. They decided they liked the look of a king post truss. We decided to give them a king post truss. Um, um, and I talked about the, the kind of strong materials need to be deep and weak materials shallow. Um, the, the glue lamb is so stiff because it's weak, it's massive, relatively weak. I mean, it's extremely strong, but relative to steel, it's weak. Um, because it's relatively weak, it's massive. Because it's massive, it's very stiff. Because it's stiff, it attracts all the load. And we put in the rods, and the rods don't get any load. Um, and, uh, and so the rods are at something like 30% utilization. So we had to make them two and a half times as big as they needed to be for strength, just to make them stiff enough to attract the load to justify their presence. Um, and Gary Williams. Who, Gary Williams, if anybody knows him, he's, he owns Timber Systems. He's a wonderful guy. He, he is the kind of the father of mass timber construction in Canada, as far as I'm, I can tell. They built this, and he said, you know, if you added two more laminations to the, to the depth of the beam, you could get rid of all that steel. But, but it was expressive, and the architect liked it, and we liked it, so we kept it. Um, we've since learned a lot of tricks, by the way, and I'll show you some of the tricks, but, but that was the situation there. An early project from 98, the Jackson Triggs uh, State Winery with, uh, that we did worked on with KPMB, some big, um, some big trusses. I should show a, f I wish I had an image of a full truss because there's been, a, there's been a, a university building in the U.S. that's been published quite a bit recently with, with their innovative zipper truss. I'm not sure if anybody has seen the zipper truss. But if you Google it, the zipper truss is essentially identical to the one that we did uh, at Jackson Triggs 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago. 
Um, Cawthorne Community Center, this, is, this could be a lessons learned talk. Um, Cawthorne Community Center with Diamond and Schmidt Architects. Um, we, uh, we conceived this trust, drew it, the architect loved it, and they, they gave us go ahead, we want that trust. Um, and then, and then we, we went to the next stage of doing the calculations and realized with the big pin in the middle it had no means of resisting wind uplift um, because the rod on the bottom would buckle. Um, so we, we made a giant moment connection at the middle and detailed it to look like we put a pin in the middle because the architect was convinced by the, uh, the, the graphic of it. And then the other thing we did, which is, which is very fun, I'm sorry for walking away from the mic, you can see that the bottom cord stops here. It doesn't go up to the, uh, it doesn't go up to the top cord. That was really important to the architect that the bottom cord didn't go up to the top cord because people, when they were running around the track, would have to run under the bottom cord and, and feel like they were going to be clotheslined. So we said, no problem. We can do this. We'll get rid of the bottom cord. We'd made everything work. And then we put the bracing in to brace the, the king post and did exactly what we got rid of the bottom cord for, but it just never showed up we, because the bracing only showed up in plan. Um, then subsequently, um, I challenged a student when I was teaching to 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 demonstrate to prove that you don't actually need that bracing, and and they built this beautiful model and showed exactly in what context. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, so subsequent to this, we 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 learned the um, uh, uh, we learned how to not need bracing for. Uh, for the bottom part of a truss, but um, the Bird Studies Canada headquarters, another project from the 90s, a lovely project, Montgomery and Sizem Architects, um, and it's essentially the same structural system we're using for, or very similar structural system we're using for 77 Wade steel frame. In fact, Jamie, this is the same similar system what you're using at the, in the distillery, right? Uh, structural steel frame with uh, with wood decks. These were not mass timber decks because it didn't exist at the time. This is mill deck. It's a uh, uh, or tongue and groove. Lovely project, Moreland's Camp Dining Hall with uh, Shim Sutcliffe, another one from from way back in the '90s. This is a, I realized as preparing this what a rich what a rich um, building culture we have in Eastern Canada in in uh, mass timber and, and glue lamb construction. We, we associate, even we in my office, associate it as a Western phenomenon. And and, um, and when I start assembling the projects that we've worked on, it, it was really uh, amazing. French River Visitor Center, um, uh, Barrett Sampson Newart Architects. This bed, oops. Um, the, on the image on the right was, uh, got this big concrete hand picking up and the two side walls are massive uh, Full story deep uh, mass timber trusses. The lovely Niagara Credit Union with Philip Beasley. And Malvern Library in Scarborough with Phil Carter and Kingsland Plus. Fielding Winery was super cool. This, this was a, so here's a lesson on mass timber um, the impact of connections. So one of the, I was sharing this this with, with with someone in my office today that that people come to us for our mass timber experience they expect us to have all the answers but the fact is no one's built the no one's built anything bigger than five stories in eastern Canada in a hundred years so nobody has all the answers what our experience in mass timber tells us is that is that acquiring the answers is a process. And if you don't know them in advance, you're going to follow, ask the questions in the order that you think is appropriate. And every once in a while, you're going to find a question that you didn't think to ask that's going to send you back, that will in inform the... Uh, and we just have to understand that's the process and communicate uh, that as a process. Fielding Estates, we sized everything as one does, um, uh, made everything as, as big as it needed to be. And then after sizing it, we went and designed the connections. We've got these big flitch plates. Um, it's a big moment frame because there's no cross walls. Big flitch plates in between because we needed moment continuity through that joint. And um, we designed the plate. 
and realized that the plates came about that far from each other. By the time we made the connection work, we had almost continuous plates. We could have designed a steel moment frame and clad it in wood. would have been simpler to construct. Um, so we really sharpened our pencil. We pulled those plates as far apart as, as we possibly could because we just didn't want to get called out on something like that. So then so 20 years later, we just admit it. Um, the cute, another cute little library in, in, uh, in Scarborough, the Mass Timber Rotunda. Oh, here's another lesson. This, is, this you cannot tell, is the lightest, most elegant truss that has ever come out of, our out of our office. It is practically invisible, and you can't tell what the structure is um, from the photograph. We would have to show. I, I wanted to find one of my original sketches, but you can, you can almost see the bottom cord cable along there. That's the uplift cable. And then that is the gravity cable, forms a bowstring. Uh, and they split in three dimensions. It was absolutely beautiful. And then along come the sprinklers. <laughs> <laughs> and then they hang the basketball nets. And all of the other infrastructure, the, uh, the, the, the structure got completely lost. But it was really exciting for a while. Um, Innisfil Recreation Center, MJMA were one of the first architects to recognize, in, in, from, from our memory, that, that um, how effective wood is in a high humidity environment and started building with, um, um, started building with mass timber in their pool environments um, because of the longevity. The, the, uh, uh, and then this is another one, um, Perkins and Will. So you can see how much lighter this, I, I don't know if, if you can, but, but this is quite a bit lighter than the Milton Leisure Center. This, this project came about a decade later. Um, by the time we did this, we had learned that, that the key to, to optimizing the utilization of steel when you're mixing it with wood like this is to pre-stress the steel. Um, so this one is a pre-stressed uh, double bow string, or double king post. Um, Scarborough Library with Lovett Goodman, which lots of people have seen a lot of recently. This is one of two really lovely projects that, that um, were built for CFB Borden, um, the Fabrique architect from, from uh, Montreal. Uh, but because there, it's a dining hall for a Canadian Forces base, nobody ever gets, no, no, not nobody sees them, but, but the general public don't tend to see them. It's a really lovely project. This is another one where, where this was a, a pre-stressed double king post think truss. Um, or, yeah, so, so a fink truss is one where the bottom cord is not continuous. So you have a web that comes up and crosses the other web, um, and there is no connection bottom cord to bottom cord. Um, and uh, it was a the the fink truss was was a bad idea by an, an, an ill-informed 19th century engineer, but we thought we'd copy it because it looked gorgeous and and really was. Um, it really did turn out nice. Um, this project is is kind of an unsung project. This is a CLT roof with with king posts that actually takes advantage. I'm 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 often dismissive of CLT because it's it's sold as a two way system, but in fact, anything that's that comes in maximum widths of eight feet is not a two way system because it only spans eight feet in the in the in the one direction. And it's so strong in one direction, or so weak in one direction relative to the strong direction that, again, it's not really a two-way system. But when we use it in a context like this one, um, we were able to, to point support the, uh, the CLT roof on, on these, these beautiful, fine king posts. This is my partner, Christian Bellini, who was the lead on this. A really lovely project. I, that is a great question, Todd. Uh, there is something done. I don't know what it was. Um, uh, I suspect, I, I don't know for sure, but, but I know that I have um, drawn the detail of, of the post going through with a top plate and hanger, hanger dowels. Um, whether that's what Christian did, I don't know. Um, 
But that's how I would handle that, is I'd just punch through, have a top plate, and hang her to else. Indigenous Learning Center at Laurentian. This is a, a project that recently opened. Another another one that, that was really lovely until the sprinklers went in, and they're not they're not too bad. Um, Eric Juan Longhouse from Brook Brook McElroy, um, and the Ontario Park uh, Waterfront uh, Park Ontario Place Waterfront Park from West Eight. Um, so these are big CLT panels acting as as steep beams. And this might have been our first multi-story, um, is the St. Jacob's Market, um, the CLT floor in, in uh, Waterloo. This was one of my favorites because, because every design decision was entirely pragmatic. This is a temporary pavilion built on the waterfront in Toronto um, during, the, um, uh, during the marathon, I don't know, four years ago maybe. Um, and it was specifically, um, it was it was up for a weekend. It needed to be built extremely quickly, um, and uh, the solution was a glue lamb structure uh, with a fabric roof. So this is a, a this is a, a stretched a, a taut fabric roof. Um, so it went up really quick, and it was uh, translucent and lovely and flat and. Um, Following that, we work on a, on, a, on a bigger permanent project. This is the St. Louis Park Arena in, um, uh, uh, in, in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, my colleague Renee, who's in the room, um, engineered much of this. Um, so big blue lamb arches. And again, this is, this is um, ETFE fabric. So this would be the same fabric that's on, on um, um, uh, the, the um, airport in Colorado, for example. So we can picture beams and girders. So we have a rich history in, in, in Eastern Canada. And, and you know, I've showed you the ones that I could think of. I, I should have done, done a, a service and, and shown some of RJC's lovely projects or Intuitive's lovely projects. I mean, there are lots and lots of really beautiful projects um, in, uh, in Ontario. Um, so what would be the floor system? So the reason we're talking about about um, mass timber these days is because we are now able to start building taller buildings and um, and there is not a well-defined archetype for a mass timber building the way there is for a concrete building or a steel building um, and so every building seems to do it differently like every every engineer architect we're, we're um, uh, in a way we're experimenting not technically experimenting because everything can be validated very fairly easily I mean, not easily it's hard but um, but um, uh, but it can all be validated. But understanding what are the best systems is not really well established. So I thought um, I was challenged by Al Salam to, to 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 do an article for the Canadian Architect that, that some of you may have seen. Um, and I thought I'm just going to talk about this kind of six systems. There can only be about six. I mean, how many ways can you assemble sticks? Um, I'll talk about them with the relative merits of of the six systems, and realize there are way more than six <coughs> systems. And it was hard to stop once I got started. So the first one is the long beam short deck. So we just have a series of beams, and we span the deck from beam to beam to beam. So this is the system. If you walk around the corner, go over to uh, the Shoppers Drug Mart around the corner, Mass Timber Building, it's the long beam short deck system. So it's uh, if there was a normal system in Mass Timber, this would be it. Um, Gary Williams once told me, Gary Williams from Timber Systems, told me that that... Um, in timber, the solution that has the cheapest deck will be the cheapest solution, which is counterintuitive because the deck is the cheap part. Um, um, so how can that one drive the cost? Well, the reason it drives the cost is because there is so much of it. Um, so the, the, uh, the fiber is less expensive, but there's an awful lot of fiber tied up in the deck. Um, so, so we're always trying to optimize the deck and build the, the beams to support it, which is why the optimal solution has the deck oriented in the short direction and the beams oriented in the long direction. Um, orienting the beams in the long direction means you have deeper beams, which means your floor-to-floor -floor heights are higher or your ceilings are lower. That's the compromise with the uh, long deck 
a long beam short deck. Short beam long deck. So we um, on Shoppers Drug Mart we started with this because the architect was concerned with um, uh, with ceiling height. Um, contractor came back and offered a half million dollar savings or something to switch the orientation. I mean I'm sure I think he had other other value engineering propositions too, but one of the things he did is switch the orientation and the architect said for or the owner said for a half million dollars I'll live with my ceilings being a little lower. Um, so short beam long deck we wind up with heavier deck but smaller beams and a lower overall floor to floor. If we want the lightest system overall we will choose to optimize our deck so if we're designing in CLT we go to a 105 millimeter deck um, because the deck drives the cost we figure out how far we can span that 105 millimeter deck and that is exactly the spacing of our beams um, and then we introduce girders to pick up the beams and distribute them to our columns. So our column grid is always al or almost always going to be driven by program uh, but the beam spacing is not. So we set the beam spacing to suit the deck and then we span that to girders. We span the beams in the long direction, the girders in the short direction because our, our our general rule is you want the more lightly loaded elements to span the longer distance and the heavily loaded elements to span the short direction. So this is the, yep. Sorry, let's go back one breath. Your, your, uh, your beams aren't standing right here. That's just a graphic. Yeah, I just, uh, I just cropped it at mid, oops, I just cropped it at mid bay. It's not, a, not intended to be, in fact, you can see that the, um, that the beam is discontinuous. Yeah, yeah. And, and someone also pointed out that, that another graphic problem is that it looks like this one is a short beam long deck. It looks like long beam short deck, but anyway, it doesn't really meaningfully change the content. So if we want to, if we want to optimize the, the cost of the structure, we want to minimize the, the amount of fiber, beams and girders is the way to go. I should say at this point that, that wood is stick built, like uh, obviously it's a, it's panels of finite width and indefinite length, strong in one direction, weak in the other, supported by beams of finite dimension and, and indefinite length, su supported by girders. Any system that is stick built like that will always favor an asymmetric grid. So something like a 1 to 1.5, like a 6 by 9 grid or an 8 by 12 grid will always be better than, than like a 9 by 9. Like the, the, um, uh, if we're doing something that's stick built, because if you can imagine that we, we try and do a nine by nine a nine by nine meter bay, our girders are spanning nine meters, carrying a nine meter width. If we take the same eighty square meters and we go to an eight by ten bay, for example, now our girders only spanning eight meters instead of nine, but we've still got the same eighty meters of, uh, of bay size. Yep. How would the girders? Uh, sorry, the girder is just framed into the side of the column, and then the beam frames into the side of the girder. Just face-mounted, face-mounted hangers. I'll show you some details of hangers a little bit later on. So, having just said that, what I said um, about the um, about the asymmetric grid, if we want to do a symmetric grid, so so what that does is impose an organization, a spatial organization. You've got an asymmetric grid. You've got a framing that is that is smaller in one direction, larger in the other. It's tighter space. So so your your um, your structure has an impact on your space planning and how you perceive the space. If you want a symmetric grid, uh, one strategy that we have not built but we explored on a project is is uh, arranging our deck elements in a parquet fashion. Um, so you alternate the orientation of the deck. Now you have beams spanning in both directions, which are identically loaded um, and identical span, so we can have a, an efficient square grid um, and uh, and not kind of impose an order or a hierarchy <coughs> in the space. Uh, Two-way point supported CLT. This was the great ambition of CLT is is to get rid of the beams. Point support. It's two-way uh, two-way strength. And this is the system that was built for Brock Commons in um, in, in BC. Um, so it's an 18-story student residence, very sh shallow floor-to-floor -floor height because there are no beams. Um, 
And as a system, it works really well for a student residence. Um, but you need to have something like a, a three by four meter bay. Um, and, and we can't have a bay bigger than the width of the uh, CLT panel. Um, and we have to recognize that the CLT is really not very strong in, in, the, uh, in the direction perpendicular to the surface fiber. But when it works, it's extremely effective. And, and so, you know, Brock Commons was built very, very fast um, and very economically. If we want to manage the floor to floor height problem, um, we can use wide flat beams. So we can actually use CLT for beams. Um, and um, so it's not an efficient use of timber because timber wants to be narrow and deep. Um, if we make it wide and flat, we need a lot more fiber to do the same amount of work. Uh, but we do constrain the depth of our floor system. Um, the thing that we have to bear in mind is that if we load, if we load our beam on that edge, we have unbalanced load more in one bay than the other. We load our beam on that edge, our um, our beam is going to topple over on us. Um, so we have to, if we're using wide flat beams, we have to manage the tendency to topple. The way we manage that is that we bear the load at the mid, middle of the beam. Our, our, our deck element or our, our deck slab has to bear in the middle of the beam over the column regardless of how wide the beam is. So making a wide beam doesn't shorten our deck span. Our deck span is to center of column because if we shorten our deck span <coughs> to the edge of the beam then our beam is going to roll over on us. Well I don't know that you actually have to have a spacer. It's one of these things that, that um, the beam will only rotate as much as the deck will allow it to rotate, which is not very much because we're, we're controlling the sag of the deck. So we wouldn't actually do it. We wouldn't actually put a spacer, but we would make sure the deck is strong enough and stiff enough to span to the, to the uh, center of column to center of column. <clears throat> Another system that we explored for a residential project is, um, is wide flat beams on top. So same system. Um, Except we put the beam on top, and we have to hang the uh, hang the the slab underneath. Um, so same depth of floor. What the the real advantage to this is is the flush ceiling. So for natural light penetration and space planning and and uh, distribution of surfaces and stuff, the flat uh, the flat soffit is nice. And it's not really if you're pouring a concrete topping anyway, it's not a big deal to fill the void in between the beams with with um, you know, billets of EPS or even to frame them up before you pour the concrete topping and get a flat surface. But it has the same issue that, that we have to hang the deck from the middle of the, the beam on top. Um, that actually also has the problem that the, whatever we're using to hang needs to be fire rated. Um, so fire rating the, the screws or the dowels is, is uh, one of our challenge because you can, you can imagine it would not be difficult to um, not be difficult to put a, a big timber washer or something under there, but it's not fire rated. So, so we need to recess and plug to conceal the uh, fire rated. So another system, the wide flat flush beams. This is essentially the system that uh, Fast and App and, and um, Moriyama Tashima advanced for their successful Arbor, um, George Brown Arbor uh, competition. Really brilliant system, but you can see that the columns are almost as wide as the beam. So they have to address the tendency for the beam to topple over, and, and the way they did it um, in the flush condition, condition is by introducing very wide columns. Um, they've also, on that project, that is uh, fully composite with a concrete topping. Uh, but it could work this way. Staggered deck. Stagger Deck is a system that, that has been built by um, uh, Michael Green um, and uh, with um, uh, Equilibrium Consulting. So it's essentially like corrugated cardboard. You take you, you stack the you stack and offset your your deck panels and and uh, from a flexural bending point of view, you've got you've got the depth of the sum of the panels. You've got the full depth of both, and the space in between gives you the opportunity to to distribute services and sprinklers and things um, in between them. So it's a great way to, to achieve long spans in your deck with, uh, without buying uh, excessive amounts of fiber. 
This is a, a system that, that we are using on a project that we're not allowed to talk about. Um, even though blog, blog TO has talked about it, we're not allowed to. Um, this is a voided uh, concrete timber composite. So um, it's a mass timber panel, and on top of the mass timber panel, we have uh, a thick topping with um, uh, plastic bubbles, HTP plastic bubbles. The, the bubbles, the plastic manufacturer is looking to make them out of uh, recycled um, uh, uh, beverage container lids. The beverage containers are one type of plastic. They're recyclable. The lids are currently not recyclable. There's no market for them. Uh, so they're looking to make the, the plastic bubbles out of uh, beverage container lids. Um, the benefit to this is that this was a solution to the, the depth of structure problem. The idea is that on an asymmetric bay, say a six meter by nine meter bay, in the six in the nine meter direction, it's fully composite. We've seen lots of composite systems with concrete and wood, where the concrete carries the compression, the wood carries the tension. Um, in the direction perpendicular to the wood fiber, the concrete is thick enough to act like a big slab band. Um, so it's a wide flat concrete beam in the direction perpendicular to the wood fiber and it's a composite system in the direction parallel to the wood fiber. And so because we've got the wide flat concrete beam, we don't need to supplement beams, and so we wind up with a shallow floor-to-floor -floor system. Even though our deck <coughs> is very deep, six by nine bay, the deck, the deck would be 500 millimeters deep, roughly. Um, but without beams, that's still a very shallow system. It's, it's not much deeper than the depth of the slab plus drop panel that you would have in the comparable concrete building. So there's there's um, there's a number. The one that we're looking at is is notched. Whoops, did I? Oh, I see. You don't. I'm I'm, I'm looking a slide ahead, and so I'm thinking we're looking at the at the prototypes. These are in in the um, in the other room, by the way. I brought them today. Um, what we're looking at is is a it's 150 by um, 50 millimeter notch every 600 millimeters, which is not very difficult to mill into the uh, top of the mass timber panel. And, and provides a very rigid shear connection. Um, this one we've the the I made up the the mock-ups with uh, by staggering uh, two by eights and two by tens. The idea is this is one of the one of the acoustic mitigation strategies is do a staggered profile with a an acoustic um, a, a, a piece of acoustically absorptive material in between. On our project, the 77 Wade project, which is the eight-story project, we're using um, a Pico Delta beam. Um, so this is a steel beam um, with a wide bottom flange, um, and the the uh, the mass timber panel sits on top of that, and then the whole thing there's a concrete topping over the whole thing. Um, this is a system that was developed for the precast industry, used with hollow core, but mass timber panels and hollow core are, are really almost directly interchangeable. In fact, the, even the depth is very similar. Um, you know, hollow core, we might go up to span up to 40 times thickness, and mass timber, we're around 30 times. So there's a depth difference, but it's really um, largely the same. But you can see that we, we conceal our beam completely within the depth of the structural system. So we have nothing that penetrates down, but we do have the wide black band of the uh, of the bottom cord of the um, or the, the bottom flange of the uh, the beam. From a fire point of view, that that um, there's rebar is put inside that core, and in the fire condition, the um, um, that beam with the concrete topping will resist the fire loads, so we don't have to fire rate that bottom plate. So this uh, the um, this was a six by nine meter bay, um, or maybe it's nine by nine even actually. So it's a it's a proper kind of commercial bay. Both of these systems, by the way, came out of out of uh, the AD Atlantic experience, which was not our experience. That that's not our project. But we did know anecdotally that that the performer for the project was a six story building with nine meter bays. It was supposed to be the equivalent of a concrete building just done in mass timber. Um, but they couldn't fit six stories in under the 18 meter high rise limit. Um, 
and then the cost and the depth of structure was, to achieve the nine by nine bay was was prohibitive. So what they built was a five story building with six by six bays. It was still tremendously successful, a wonderful project, but the depth of structure is a real problem for for um, mass timber, and uh, and so we developed this one to solve that problem, and then the Pico is a is a, a product that came from Europe, the Delta Beam. So I'm going to show you some fanciful. So once I got started on this, I, I started exploring what are the things that we can do that no one's thought of yet. One of them is a was a, a long span solution without beams. How do we, if we wanted a 12 by 12 meter, 15 by 15 meter bay without beams, what would we do? And so this is the idea, what I've called a stressed skin lattice. We orient uh, mass timber panels in one direction on the top layer and in the opposite direction on the bottom layer. And the top skin is composite with the, the lower lattice layer. And the bottom skin is composite with the upper lattice layer. So we have full composite action um, in both directions, both directions equally strong and stiff for a long span, long span two-way system. So there's the other layer, the cross section of, of the, the system in one direction. The other one that we've, we've played with, again, as a fanciful idea, is a, is a reciprocal frame. So this is the beam and girder version of, or sorry, the two-way version of the beam and girder. A reciprocal frame um, is, um, there was a researcher did, who described it as a, uh, a mutually, a, a network of mutually supporting beams is a reciprocal frame. And you can see that neither, no beam goes all the way from a support to a support. Every single beam goes from a support to another beam, which goes from a support to another beam. But once they are in, a, in an interconnecting grid, they wind up being, um, being uh, rigorous. And this is something that was developed by, by Frederick Zollinger in the, in, uh, after the First World War. He was developing systems for, for air, air, airplane hangars. Uh, when, they, when all the steel had been directed to the war effort, they were building with small dimensional lumber. Anyway, we associate reciprocal frames with, with vaults, but they don't have to be vaulted. We can build them flat. Um, oh, the lamella, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. That's what. Uh, so reciprocal frame is the kind of more generic. Uh, lamella would be the the uh, um, colloquial. Um, the reciprocal frame is not especially efficient for for the static load, but one thing that's interesting about it is that. The, the vibration performance of a floor is, is determined by how much it sags when one person walks on it, not by how much it sags when the room is full. With a reciprocal frame, if you're the one person, every single beam is contributing to carrying your weight. So if we have a reciprocal frame that's designed to sag 10 millimeters under an assembly load. It's the same 10 millimeters that the, that the non-reciprocal frame would have sagged under an assembly load. Under the assembly load, they are performing equally. The reciprocal <coughs> frame would deflect a half a millimeter under the one-person load, whereas the conventional system would deflect two millimeters under the one-person load because the conventional system, only one beam is carrying your weight, whereas a reciprocal frame... Um, they are all contributing. You're loading every single one. So effective for vibration, um, if not especially efficient for uh, distributed loads. Um, this is the lamella that you were referring to. This is the, the, the flattened version of the Zollinger lamella, the, the one that we're done with, with uh, uh, that we, we are typically associate with the vaults, like the Fort York Armory is a beautiful example, but it can be flattened. I was thinking if I'm going to if I'm going to kind of be speculative um, and talk about Zollinger, I, I challenged myself to say, what would Nervi do? Um, <laughs> and and in fact, this is an extremely efficient structure. Um, once we get over the fact that that you that you have to curve 25% um, of your beams in plan, um, it's actually extremely efficient. 
because there's no accumulating load. Every single beam goes all the way to the column um, and takes the load directly to the column. The, um, the beams that are in the annular ring um, are there just to take the torsion out of the curved beams. So I'm, I'm going to just keep, I'm going to keep throwing this into presentations until, until someone decides that it's interesting enough to build one. Um, and this, of course, came from, uh, from Nervi's uh, Palace of Labor in turn was, uh, um, was the inspiration for that one. Um, dealing with actually ex many of the very same constraints that we're dealing with now. So as you know, we, we have historically been, or in the last 50 years, been a labor-driven economy um, with, with labor amounting to two-thirds or something of the, of the cost of construction. Um, in mass timber, fiber accounts for two-thirds of the cost of the construction. So the, the, the paradigm has shifted when we're dealing in mass timber. And we're looking for solutions that will optimize material, not optimize labor, which opens us up to doing things that are much more interesting, in fact. And as we move to a carbon economy, that, that shift is just going to become um, more prominent. Um, the, the, the kind of move away from material intensive uh, solutions. So this is just a little diagram to show that, that all the red beams are the ones that are load bearing and you can see that every load bearing beam finds its way directly to the column uh, without accumulating load and then the blue annular beams are just bridging to take the, uh, take the rotation out. Another system that we're seeing is a cassette system and cassette literally just means box. Um, <coughs> Uh, typically, cassette. When we talk about cassette, we're talking about pre-assembled elements, large elements that that, um, um, and and it's generally associated with long spans. Not always boxes. We're doing uh, we're seeing mass timber T's and double T's, which would all kind of fall into the cassette. Um, but it's a great way to achieve very long spans uh, with with optimal material. And there's a company called Lignature um, from Europe that are incorporating acoustic mitigation into a cassette system. So I'm, I am sure that it is that it costs as much as solid gold, but it is a really an incredibly beautiful and, and effective system in, in so many ways. Um, because we're in the early days of, of mass timber, there are lots of proprietary systems around, just like there were in concrete in, in the 40s and 50s. Um, um, we're, we're seeing um, proprietary systems. This is just one example, Cree by Romberg, which is a which is kind of precast slab panels that are composite with wood beams and and uh, and concrete. They've got steel. There's a whole mishmash, but I think it's it's uh, quite effective. Some of the things we've been playing with are C are CLT shells. So imagine if we could. We could form concrete. We have no continuity from panel to panel here, so that there's so in a way the the the, uh, the wood is acting in compression as a formwork, but probably doesn't contribute very much to the to the overall strength. But what it does do is it allows us to absolutely optimize and refine the concrete. Um, so we we're using the wood as a concrete. Um, reduction strategy as opposed to as a concrete replacement strategy. Another one that we played with is with, with nail laminated timber. So we've talked about CLT because that people associate that with, uh, with mass timber. Uh, with nail laminated timber, it's just two bys all nailed together into big panels. Um, you, can, you can warp the panels without any great cost premium. You just set the the jig up that way at one end and that way at the other end and you're going to make a warped uh, nail lamp. So we can use nail laminated timber to um, create high pars to optimize a concrete topping, again as a concrete reduction strategy. And you're getting full composite action out of that. We, well, I mean, this particular one, there's no continuity across the panel joint in the in the the in the wood material, and so it doesn't really buy you very much from a bending stiffness point of view. There is another one that I don't have that I don't have a, a slide where we looked at taking doing the the high power panel but going full span with it. So the 
you know, essentially stretch out the high power from, from column to column, and there we would make it composite. Um, so I thought I'd share this. Um, you know, what we're used to doing as, uh, as engineers and designers, we, we choose our structural system, we decide how big everything it is, is going to be, then we connect the pieces together, and then we fireproof the system by adding drywall and spray cementitious fireproofing. And so it's, it's a fairly linear process. What, what we learned a long time ago is that in mass timber, you've got to be very, or in wood, you've got to be very conscious of the connection because the connection can drive the size of the member, um, your ability to connect it. So we always make sure we look at the connections early. What was not as apparent, well, I mean, what was not as apparent is that your the fireproofing can lead you to a different solution. That it's not just choose your optimal solution and then add however much lumber material you need for fireproofing, it can actually point you to a different solution. So um, you can see what I've done is I've plotted, looked at, at um, five different systems, and I've plotted the volume of lumber against the fire rating or the duration of fire. So at zero, at a zero duration fire, um, things are behaving more or less like I said. There's beam and girder with NLT. That would be beam and girder with CLT. Uh, that one's the, the bubble lamb or the timber concrete composite, so it's a bit, a bit of an outlier. Um, and then we get into um, beam, and, beam and NLT, beam and CLT. So these line up pretty well exactly as I would have expected. What's interesting is look what happens here at two hours. We, with CLT on with beam and girder, um, we are increasing by virtue of the fact that we have to add the layer to the CLT and a fire burns through not one layer but two because the second layer isn't doing anything for you. Um, for, yeah, for at two hours, beam and girder with CLT, the volume of lumber is is actually greater than the volume of lumber with NLT or DLT and beams. So with this one, you start with a thick deck, but you get two-hour rating without all that much increase in wood. You know, it's only a, a 25 or 30 percent increase in wood to get to two hours when we have beam and NLT, whereas beam and girder with CLT were more than twice the amount of wood at two hours. That's right. We chose NLT. Well, NLT partly because it's more economical uh, in general, but but um, um, but um, but certainly the the thickness is driven by uh, by fire. Um, you know, the general rule is is we burn through 41 millimeters, 41 millimeters of wood per hour, um, but in CLT because of the tendency for delamination and, I, and, a, and a bit of conservatism in the industry, we actually consider it to be 65 millimeters per hour. So with CLT, after two hours, we're considered to have burned through 130 millimeters, which burns us into a transverse layer, which doesn't do us any good. So we're 130 millimeters plus whatever it takes to get up to the next longitudinal layer. So we, there's a, so, so fire winds up driving our, um, winds up driving our system. We don't choose our system and then fire rate it. We have to start with fire and, and that will dictate the system. So what about the connection? So we got a lot of things we have to manage with connections. We have to, to transfer load. That's the simple thing. Uh, our connections need to be ductile. Um, from a seismic point of view, um, our structures need to be ductile. They have to absorb energy. That's the trick in, in an earthquake is, is energy absorption. Concrete reinforcing, the reinforcing yields, absorbs energy. Concrete is a very ductile system. Steel, if we moment connect, we, we um, steel joints, like there are lots of techniques for making steel ductile. Wood is not ductile. Failure modes in wood are all brittle failure modes. Um, 
but we have an obligation to meet ductility if we're going to build big buildings. We have an obligation, even in Toronto, where we don't really have earthquakes, we have an ob obligation to meet certain ductility thresholds. And so ductility um, has to come from the connection. It's not that we can't make wood buildings ductile, but we can't make wood ductile. So we have to in introduce ductile elements. Um, and we need to manage fire and we need to manage shrinkage. So this is one of our details from the, the uh, U of T tower. So we can see we've got plates knifed in, into the steel with hundreds of small diameter dowels um, through. And what those small diameter dowels are doing is, is in an earthquake, they can bend and yield and, and absorb energy. So that's where all of our ductility comes in. Uh, comes in in those big clusters of dowels. We can see that the beams frame into the side so that there's a direct vertical load path through the columns so that we don't get accumulating shrinkage. This is, a, I, I pulled this off the web, it was published in Architectural Record or something, but a really lovely diagram. We couldn't, we didn't have a, like, we've, you know, we've, we've got some really lovely models, but we didn't have one as nice as this, so I used the one from Architectural Record. Um, um, but you can see that how they've addressed some of these challenges. So this looks like a simple saddle connection, right? Um, and it is, it's a simple saddle connection, but it doesn't go all the way down to the beam, bottom of the beam. It slips inside the beam here um, because the wood has to fire protect it. It's not as wide as the beam. It sits inside a, 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 a milled groove in the beam because, again, the wood has to fire protect it. Um, you can see that we've got a continuous load path for the for the column. Um, we've got these elements in here to transfer in in plane shear. Um, so we wind up with with um, uh, with very complicated connections once we have start having to fire protect the connection. If we didn't have to fire protect them, everything would just be a nice seat. Um, or like the mill buildings, we'd have these cast capitals and things. We'd, we'd expose the steel, but um, but we have to fire protect them, and uh, and we do that with the wood. Um, we did a retrofit of a project in St. Catharines, the the uh, Marilyn Walker School for the Performing Arts, and there was a historic part of the building, and we actually fire protected existing connections by encasing them in wood. Um, this is a detail from Brock Commons. Um, so this was, Brock Commons is point supported. So all of those CLT panels have to sit on top of the column. Eight stories at, at eight inches or three sixteenths of an inch, 18 stories, three sixteenths of an inch shrinkage per story would have been, you know, another eight or 10 inches of shrinkage over the course of the building. Couldn't happen. Um, but the, the CLT had to sit on top of the column. And so Brock Commons detailed this, um, this pipe sleeve to, to pass through the CLT to transfer the load directly. And this is a proprietary system called a Sherpa. There's a number of proprietary systems out here like this, but it's a very high strength system um, that can be completely encapsulated or enclosed in the wood um, for fire protection. And beauty, of course. I mean, the, we, we use these connectors on a project and, um, that I didn't think to show but um, just because it's so beautiful, it didn't need to be fire rated, but they're so clean. But in order to work, they need a myriad of screws. Okay, so we're almost at the end. I thought I'd flip through and show, show you just a few multi-story. Showed you a bunch of roofs. Um, these are the multi-story projects that we can look at. Shoppers Drug Mart, you can visit as you, on your own. fact. The, the, pro, the photos I have, it's open now, but I don't have any completed photos. So here's a construction photo, but, but really, really lovely wood. Um, although I can tell you, so here's an anecdote about this. We, we're doing a project with Meccano right now, a, a, a um, student residence at U of T, and we took them on a tour of this, and they were really put off by the fact that the, um, that, um, the beams and columns were Douglas fir. They came from Western Canada. The CLT was spruce. It came from Europe, and they thought that was just unacceptable, and not un, not ununderstandably 
um, they thought that was unacceptable. That was part of the half million dollar savings, though, and that's and so the owner was presumably happy with it. But um, but but getting grain matching wood when we're dealing with CLT and glue lamb is something we've got to be very careful careful about. Um, this is AD Atlantic that I referred to a few times that I'm sure everybody's quite familiar with. Um, TRCA headquarters. So when we when we developed the 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 voided concrete timber uh, composite system. This was a project we were working on at the time. This was a building that for program reasons needed to be six stories and was constrained by the 18 meter high rise height limit. And so we had a really tight floor to floor height, but, but normal commercial office demands for space planning. Um, and uh, so we developed this as, as in the, uh, as um, the, it, I don't, what were we doing? We were doing concept design prior to RFP. This is the interior view, a rendering. Um, the project was was successfully awarded to ZAS with RJC, and they had to make it a four-story building, um, or they did make it a four-story building, um, and and part of that was about about the height. I mentioned 77 Wade. This is the, our project that I was referring to. Um, and you can see right in the rendering, we've got the, the gray bands, which are the, the uh, delta beams. Um, U of T academic tower, the model of this in your office right now, the physical model. So one of the reasons why this one went to wood, this, this would have been a, an ideal concrete building, except that it was built on top of the loading dock of... Um, the existing, um, the existing Goldring Athletic Center, and the soils were really crappy underneath. So we designed the Athletic Center and we designed the loading dock in anticipation of a, of a building, but we couldn't put a concrete building. It was too heavy. So we had to, to design a steel building to, to put on it. U of T came back and said, we really want to do a mass timber building. We had to take one story off the building because the, the wood was too heavy. The wood system was heavier than the steel system. I'm sure I've got some details wrong on that, Leland, but that was more or less what happened, right? Uh, we were also constrained in height, and the and the and the wood system was a little deeper than the steel system, so um, so loss of story made a difference there. McEwen Architecture Building in in um, Laurentian in Sudbury. Um, so this is a true mass timber two-story building, a really extraordinary building. This part here, the, the, the giant cantilever, this is all steel portion of the building. So the mass timber portion, <laughs> the mass timber portion is, uh, is the other side of the building. It does not have a 40-foot cantilever. <laughs> um, this was a this was a, a competition entry that, that we, we entered with uh, MJMA and Pat Cow for the arbor. Was amazing building, not successful. Uh, the successful project is the is the Moriyama Toshima scheme with the wide flat beams. Um, I've referred to the point supported. The, this is the um, um, Brock Commons project with Acton Austrian Fast and App. This is point supported CLT, um, and so you can see that the bay is roughly eight foot by twelve foot, small bay size, but but ideal for a student residence, so it was fine. And give you a sense just how just how tall that building is. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. That's a good point, Jamie. I mean, that that project is entirely encapsulated. I think there's a small area at the roof level that that the uh, mass timber is exposed to view, but it's it's all encapsulated in in, uh, in gypsum wallboard. And then there are a few projects underway. We we were really excited for a time that. Had the, the U of T tower been built, it would have been the tallest in the world if it was built at that time that we were designing it. But there were probably a dozen projects on the boards that had the same dubious bragging rights, um, including the, the Majosa Tower, Mjosa Tower in Norway, um, um, the Holyo Tower in Vienna, which is 24 stories or 84 meters tall. Um, and then this is not the current sidewalk lab scheme. Uh, but I don't know what the sidewalk lab scheme currently is. So, but this is a lovely rendering. Some cool stuff happening in Toronto. Um, 
I don't have uh, I don't have a rendering of yours, Jamie. I, I, I wish I did. It'd be loved, lovely to show. This is a project we're not allowed to talk about, so I'll just skip over it. <laughs> but you can read all about it in Blog To. Um, and I'll end with, with this one. The Fogong Temple Pagoda, um, uh, built in 1056. It's almost 1,000 years old. 67.3 meters makes it only about 3 meters shorter than, uh, uh, than the academic tower at U of T. Um, and uh, all in, all in uh, uh, heavy timber frame. So that, that's the inspirational to slide to leave on. So, so thank you for your patience. Thank you, um, David. Um, you talked about um, developers, and, and there's a number of academic buildings, certainly in Toronto. There's, there's a few uh, that are going up. Um, can you talk a little bit about developers' reaction to mass timber buildings and whether they're really you know, um, approaching mass timber buildings? Uh, you, you talked about the costs, obviously, which is part of it. Uh, can you talk about how they're approaching the mass timber buildings? Sure, I yeah. am. Um, uh, so, so the question was, how, did, how are developers reacting to mass timber buildings? I think that that um, that some have an ideological response, um, but but the the downtown developers, uh, in in our experience, have gotten over the ideological barrier and and have embraced it for the for the, for the values that that it brings. So. That would be true of Allied or Hallmark or Distillery, if I could say that, Jamie. Um, um, and uh, and so then the question is all about the the technical barriers. Um, what are, what are the costs going to be? What are, are we going to have problems in in the uh, in the approvals process? A lot of people are are concerned about supply. We've got so many projects coming on stream in Canada right now uh, in mass timber and and a very small number of of uh, suppliers in Canada, um, but we're bringing mass timber from Europe, and uh, and there's lots of supply in Europe. So the 77 Wade project, um, some or all of that mass timber is coming from Europe, um, and uh, and there, you know it's it's very high quality and and economical. So bringing mass timber from Europe is something like a third less expensive than bringing it from BC. Um, and the 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 people who are bringing it are are uh, suggesting that that um, the environmental impact of bringing it by boat from Europe is better than the impact of bringing it by rail from BC. I don't know if that's true because it's the people who want us to believe that that are telling us that. <laughs> but uh, but I'm happy to share that to to pass a to pass along that bit of misinformation. Um, but so so the anecdote people are very concerned about supply. It has not been our experience that supply has yet been a problem, um, and uh, and we do have lots more coming on stream. So we have um, Element Five, who are building a big manufacturing facility in St. Thomas, uh, and they have relationships from Europe, so they're bringing it in. Um, Nordic, the capacity of Nordic and Shibugumu is enormous. Um, they're selling millions of of square feet of development um, into the US right now. And uh, so so they've got enormous capacity. We've got uh, Guardian Structures right in in, uh, uh, in uh, Stratford um, who are making CLT and glue lamb. They're, that are, they're, kind of, they're kind of skirting on the outskirts of the industry right now, but they have capacity to produce and we're doing buildings with them. Um, so we're not seeing the supply as actually a problem. Um, and then there's expertise concerns, and that's a like that's a legitimate concern. But I think that cuts across right right across construction. Let's open it up to uh, questions from the floor. Yeah. I work for Kalistikov. I know Dave. Ah. I work for Kalistikov Mass Timber, and they're a new uh, manufacturer out of the uh, vertically. In Nelson, right? Kalistikov. Yeah. They're yes, in, are they are in Nelson, are they not? In BC? Yeah, exactly. And uh, we're vertically integrated with the other vertical integrated company other than Nordic. So uh, we're bidding on we're bidding on a few projects in Toronto now, and I think uh, on most of them. 
Yeah, we're really excited to see see Kolesnikov um, up and running and, and contributing. And, and we're working with Spearhead on some stuff right now where you're kind of, I'm not sure what the relationship, but there's a relationship I know. And uh, yeah. Spearhead head are fantastic. So We're also working with uh, Bright Design at Toronto. Right. And we have worked with Bright Design in Toronto. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we go back to the team, Chris. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned that connections and ductility of connections and connection design tend to move earlier in the design process um, with wood just because of the viability of, of wood or the lack of ductility. With a tall building, and I'm, I'm leading towards yeah. towards a you know pro problem that, that we'll encounter soon or engage with soon with a tall structure where we may be forced into encapsulation that would then take us down a different path with the, would it not because you would be you would be fire protecting those joints also through encapsulation that it would for sure once we're encapsulating then then we're then it liberates a lot of um, a lot of problems from the um, from the joint because because we, we don't have to completely conceal all the steel, which is which makes life an awful lot easier. Um, it doesn't change the hundred small dowels. I mean, that's the way we get our our, um, our uh, lateral ductility. But I can tell you that, and and maybe I'm maybe I'm lazy. I don't kind of embrace the the challenge quite the same way as some other engineers do. The the U of T tower, we have no choice. Um, the, the lateral system is in the frame, in the perimeter frame, all the diagrid, um, and uh, because the gravity system is in the diagrid, that's how we're achieving. We're hanging, you know, we're we're hanging the building nine meters or, or <coughs> six meters, cantilever it on the south side over the existing building. So we've got this perimeter diagrid frame anyway, and it's going to carry all the lateral load. So we have to make them ductile. Um, the other project, the unnamed project, we're, we're just putting concrete cores in. And uh, I mean, that may have evolved, but I'm pretty sure we're just putting concrete cores in. Because if we're, that's a, that, um, it's a major concession to the, the building authorities um, to use a concrete core um, for, you know, your vertical circulation elements. It's also a major concession to the elevator company. Because right. They won't put an elevator. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, there are some LS, but yeah, but, but uh, ask the five big manufacturers yeah. in Ontario. Yeah, you'll get one who'll say maybe, the other four no. Huh. Yeah, it's hard to imagine why why Mass Timber would perform differently from an elevator point of view, but completely uh, unexplainable. Yeah. But then once we're doing a concrete core, which solves like it's, it helps with fire issues, it solves an elevator problem. Then we can have all our ductility. We just make the concrete core our lateral system, and, and uh, we do, we get our ductility in a very conventional way using but reinforced concrete. Speed. Speed. That's right. Yeah, yeah. The speed controls. Okay. Speed of construction. Yes. So the, the 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 pouring of the the the, the core sets the pace of, of uh, the erection um, and so so the, the benefit of fast construction goes away so, um, I was looking at the systems and I was in anticipation of this patented uh, uh, system that has uh, panelized CLTs that, that would uh, uh, produce uh, uh, last plate without uh, limit I would love to know about that. There was one proprietary system that I encountered and then I could never find it again and I wanted to incorporate it into the into the presentation and maybe that's the one. There's um um but I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I would love I would love that. Yeah. Change it to ask me the question, not to repeat you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I I would love to know. I would love to know. It, because the next time I give this talk, I'll include it. <laughs> Including the piece for Joe. Yeah, that's right. I'm, gonna, I'm putting that one in tonight. That is done. <laughs>
Yeah. You'll hear the right to pass, but can you comment on the impact of the improvements to our social services getting, you know, in terms of the time we have? Is that getting better? Is it, like, how impactful or how does it feel like trust? So on 77 Wade, it was pretty good. Like, we, you start early. You know, we don't wait until permit drawings are completed. Um, we start uh, at, you know, SD, I think, with, with the preliminary report, and you get feedback, you have meetings, and, and that one went reasonably well. On the academic tower, we hit a certain point where they said, we will not, ex we will not review your alternative solution proposal until your drawings are permit ready. And um, which, of course, like that approvals process informs so many decisions that it would almost make the project a non-starter. Uh, but that that policy was in place for I don't know three weeks maybe, yeah, like a little longer, but yeah, not too long. Not very long, very yeah. Long. And they've conceded on that. Then would you mind? This is Leland from McLean Yonkong Miller, who's the project lead on the the academic tower. So so Leland has really been dealing with the approvals in a way that I haven't. Right. So I mean, we're still going through the process. It's not it's not a, a driver for us right now. So the project's not up to the spot. But um, the key problem for that project is that so we currently have a wood core, and we're hoping to maintain that. We can't have a property core for, for reasons that they illustrated earlier. So we're trying to negotiate the, the wood core. And it's the fire department particularly that's the problem. So the building department, no, no real issue. We have a, a very elaborate uh, alternative solution document prepared, and they're very happy with that. But the fire department, not too much. But some of the challenges you face are, are, and tell me if I'm wrong, we were looking at having to encapsulate the wood core in, in, in drywall, which was fine. That's not a difficult concession, but it has to be encapsulated during construction. The, the core needs to be rated during construction. So you can imagine the, suddenly we have to environmentally protect a core that's encapsulated in gypsum wallboard. Like that becomes, some of those things become quite complicated. Yeah, something, I mean, they make steel elevator cores with shaft wall in the United States, so how is this? Well, we do it here too, right? Yeah. Oh, is it shrinkage, do you think? Yeah, it's, it's ideological, it's right? It's not. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't done it, so they don't want to do it. Yeah. Just a quick one more. Um, so, at 77 Wade, uh, was there any questions? about using NCC versus OPC, and which one was the higher standard? Sorry, NBC? Yeah. The, the national? Yes. Um, well, we it doesn't conform to either okay. explicitly. So one way or the other, we're doing alternative solutions. So okay. NBCC leads ahead of OBC, of course. And so, so we would be using anticipated provisions <coughs> in NBCC as a, as a um, an argument in support of our alternative solution. So if I could um, just thank David for coming. This is you've been here before. Yeah, you're welcome. This, this, fun. Is, this great uh, this is a great kickoff to our 2020 speaker series. Um, we're going to continue this uh, in the next room. We have something to eat and something to drink, which is I'm sure everybody's uh, happy about that.